And now, uh, yeah. after finalizing chapter two, we can assume that we have uh, a good technique for forecasting. And uh, the next step will then be to create a plan, production plan, um, for which um, might be based on that uh, forecast. Uh, this chapter three, we should first uh, look at different strategies for uh, this aggregate planning um, in the subchapters uh, three one to three four, and then uh, I'm, I'm not sure how far I will get today, but I will continue in uh, in two weeks. Uh, as you remember, next week it will be a guest lecture about vehicle routing. Um, and this vehicle routing is a typical optimization problem. And uh, after that, we will continue by looking at these aggregate planning uh, problems uh, as an optimization problem, which also can be solved to optimality by, uh, by using this linear programming uh, technique and solving it by a solver. Uh, and this is uh, also uh, yeah, sh uh, shown in, uh, in the supplement for, uh, for this chapter 3, uh, which describes uh, li the linear programming technique. And in chapter 3, 5 and 6, it's more detailed how this or these types of problems can be, be, uh, be showed as um, a linear programming problem. Uh, this part about linear programming is uh, also treated in some other courses that uh, some of you might take. Uh, the Operation Analysis course, uh, Book 350, uh, is uh, one course which also treats th this uh, uh, linear programming technique uh, with some other point of views, but still the technique is, uh, is also shown in, in this course. But still, uh, this is a central part of the curriculum in, in uh, this course uh, too. So, let's now first talk about this aggregate planning. And the goal here is to plan the, what we call the gross workforce level and uh, set some uh, firm-wide production plan. And uh, the concept is predicated on the idea of aggregate unit of production. And by using what we call the aggregate units, we should be able to make a more uh, accurate forecast. Uh, sometimes this is actual units, but sometimes it could also be weights. If you are talking about uh, steel, for example, producing steel, this, the weight is uh, shown in tons. There could be volume, gallons of gasoline. There could be worker hours. It could be money. And sometimes it's also uh, useful to use what we call a fictional quantity. Uh, and I will show an example to that in, in, in a short while. Because it's if you have different types of the same products, it's often most useful to, to make a fictional unit and to make a forecast on that uh, fictional unit. The example we will see is about washing machines, which might have different types at the dif uh, with different, uh, uh, well, different advances and, and different price. Uh, and it's much easier to make a forecast of the number of washing machines to sell than to make se uh, separate forecasts for each uh, washing machine uh, type. Uh, so let's now first show the problem here that we suppose that we have the demands, which is the forecast of uh, demand for aggregate units over the planning horizon. And you have the problem here to determine both the workforce level and also the production level to minimize the total cost over this planning horizon. So first you know more or less what is the forecast. It could be actual orders or it could be, uh, it could be a, a forecast which you think is more or less uh, accurate. And then you should try to find out how many workers do you need and what should the production be in each of these periods. It could be periods, could be months or uh, weeks or days eventually, but you should, have, uh, uh, you should be able to, uh, to find out how many workers and what, how much should you produce in, uh, uh, in, in this uh, period. So, we also need to consider some important issues uh, shown here. We have uh, the smoothing issue which is some kind of cost and disruptions that result from making changes from one period to the next. 
if you have the same production level, the same number of workers producing the same every week, it's kind of smooth production. If you're changing every week, there will be some costs and uh, also some kind of difficulties about uh, uh, making changes to, uh, to a plan uh, every, every time uh, or very often. Uh, bottleneck planning is another topic here, uh, which uh, is uh, the problem of meeting a peak demand because of capacity restrictions. If you suddenly find out that in one coming period you will have a very high demand compared to the uh, other periods, then this could be what we call a, a bottleneck and uh, you will have a problem of meeting the demand for that particular uh, period. Uh, the planning horizon is of course very important here, that you have a given period, a number of periods t, but what is the right period here? Should you make a forecast or uh, should you plan for all periods in the full year? Should you plan for only the few coming uh, closest uh, periods or whatever? How much should you uh, plan for uh, or wh what should this uh, value t be? How many, uh, how many uh, periods should you plan for? And you have also what we call the rolling horizon. Uh, which is that when one period appears, then you include the next period in, in time. So you will always have a forecast or, or a production plan for T periods. Or you can make a plan which you stick to until you make a new plan at another uh, time. So here we have different rolling horizon and end of horizon uh, effect, which is important issues here. Uh, the treatment of demand, assume that the demand is known, then you should ignore uh, uncertainty to focus on the predictable or systematic variations in demand such as uh, seasonality. So here this is also an issue to, uh, to consider uh, sometimes even if there is uncertainty you should just just ignore that uncertainty and try to focus on what you uh, what you what you can predict and assume that the forecast is uh, is accurate even if there, there will be some uncertainty. So Yeah, we have different types of costs shown here. Uh, smoothing costs, we talked about that, changing the size of the workforce, changing the number of units produced. Holding cost is quite important, uh, a cost of which is uh, um, the cost of storing inventory. And uh, what is said here, the primary component it is what we call the, the internal interest rate is the opportunity cost of investment. If you invest in a large stock, you cannot use that money otherwise. Uh, but if you don't have that uh, large stock, you could use that money, put it in the bank to get some interest or invest it uh, in, in some other, uh, uh, well, something else. Uh, holding cost is also other things that, uh, than this uh, opportunity cost or the internal interest rate. It could be, uh, well, insurance, of course, if you have a large stock, you, sh you need to insure it. Uh, it could be uh, cost of keeping the physical space. It could be lots of other things uh, included in, in this holding cost. Shortage cost is something which is uh, the cost of getting short. Uh, if you don't have uh, the product when a customer asks for it, then you might lose the sale, which is considered as a cost. You will lose the the profit, uh, you might still be able to deliver it, uh, m uh, but with a delayed delivery that might also be costly. You might need to give a discount or, or any other, uh, uh, other cost uh, compared to uh, when you have some kind of have the, the shortage if you, you're getting short of, of, the, of the product. And there are lots of other costs, payroll, overtime, subcontracting, and, and other types of, of costs which can be uh, included and needs to be uh, needs to be considered. This is uh, examples on aggregate units as we have talked about. Actual units, if you have a very simple product then we, we just count the number of units. Uh, weight, volume, dollars or money um, could be units but also what we talked about the fictionous aggregate units some kind of fictionist uh, units, which is not actually possible to just point at one product and say this is one unit, but it's put together with several um, similar types of, of products. 
This is one example of one aggregate unit, where we are talking about different models of washing machines. We have this one, A5532, use 4.2 hours of production, have a price of 285, and this one will have a total of 32% of the sales. Uh, another one is a bit more advanced, takes also some more time to produce, have a higher price, but have a lower amount uh, or percentage amount of, of, of the sales and so on. And in this example, you have six different models, which is a bit more advanced according to the number of working hours to produce and will have a higher price. But as we can see here, the percentage uh, of, of sales is uh, highest on, on the, the simplest machines. And here, of course, we could make a forecast for each of these six types of uh, uh, washing machines, but then you will have quite high uncertainty uh, because uh, it is often much easier to say that, to, to forecast and say that uh, while you will sell a certain number of washing machines in the coming periods, but the uh, number of each type might be uh, a bit more uncertain. This could, could vary, and suddenly some of the more advanced machines could be more popular into to the future. But it's rather uh, easy, or at least it's much easier to say that, okay, a certain number of people will buy a washing machine in the coming uh, periods. So here, we can try to define an aggregate unit. Lots of the different components in the washing machines are similar. They will vary according to well, some, uh, some, some components, but some of them will also be quite, quite similar. And uh, to make a forecast, we can try to create an aggregate unit, which is not necessarily proportional to worker hour. Uh, yeah, well, this is the price and uh, the working hours, which is not necessarily proportional. So then you should not use any of these as the aggregate units, but rather here try to define an aggregate unit as one unit of washing machine, which requires 32% of the uh, cheapest washing machine, which uses 4.2 working hours. 21% uh, of the second cheapest one, which is, uses 4.9 uh, working hours, and similar, 6% of the most expensive, which uses 5.8% of the uh, of working hours. So if we go back to here, the aggregate unit in this case will be this column multiplied by this column, and remember this is percentage, so this is 0.32. Then we will have one typical washing machine, which is not necessarily uh, equal to any of these models, but is some kind of aggregate units which will represent the sales of a washing machine. So forecast at a higher level might be done with these aggregate units instead of forecasting for this model, this model, and this model, and so on, uh, independently. and. Uh, because then you will have a much, uh, much higher degree of, of uncertainty. So let's now look at uh, the example here where we use these types of aggregate uh, units. And here we have forecast for January to August for eight months for a typical washing machine, which is uh, the uh, well aggregate units, uh, which is based on all the different models. And here we have eight months of forecast. 420 in January, 280 in February, 460, 190, 310, 145, 110, 125. And we have also information here about starting inventory at the end of December, which is 200, so you already have 200 on stock. And the firm would like to have, for some reason, 100 units on hand at the end of August. So now 
we should try to find the monthly production level according to this, um, this particular product and this particular uh, plan. <coughs> so let's now just make a table that uh, we have now eight months. We have a forecast, which is 420 in January, and uh, similar to 80, 460, 190, 310, 145, 110, and 120. But, as we remember, we have to adjust by 200, because we already have 200 on stock. So here, the actual demand will be 420 minus 200. So the demand here, if we now assume that the forecast is accurate, will be 220 in January. And then 280. 460, 190, 310, 145, 110, and then we remember also here we would like to have 100 units on stock at the end of August, so we need to produce to meet that demand. So here we should actually have a total of 225. So this is now the demand for the eight months in this year. What we should now try to produce uh, or find a strategy to produce uh, this number uh, according to, well, different types of objectives. So let's now put up a new column, which we call the cumulative demand, uh, which means this will be the demand up to one particular month. cumulative demand or the cumulative D in January, this will be equal to the actual demand, 220. In February, we need to produce the demand for January and February, which is a total of 500. In March, we need to produce these 500 for the first two months and a new 460, which is a total of 960. And then, in April, 190 plus the demand from January to March, which is uh, 1150. Then, for May, we add 310, uh, 310 more, which is 1460. And then we add 145, which is 1605. And for July, 110, 17, 15. And for August, 225, which gives a total of 1940. So what this table tells us, that in the full, uh, uh, in, in the eight month, in this planning period, we need to produce a total of 1940. We need to produce 210, uh, 220, at least 220 in January to meet the demand in that month. We need to produce at least 500 for January and February to meet the demand for those months, and, and, and so on. And this, because in, in this planning example, we are not allowed to get a stock out. We should plan so we are able to deliver, uh, to deliver for all these, uh, the demand given in all these months. So, this is the same table. What we will see when we make a graph here is the, uh, the graph which uh, looks like this. And uh, we can see that if we are 
producing uh, on the same level, the same uh, uh, demand uh, uh, production rate, we will produce a total of 1940, which is this point. But the problem will be that uh, you will not uh, I can start here. If you start at 220, then uh, or at, at the, the incoming uh, level of, of 200, of course, then we will have a stock out in some of the months in between. You will have produced exactly the amount, uh, the number you need by August, but in the periods between here, you will actually have a stock out in maybe February, at least in March and April and May and so on, a fixed rate of producing 1940 in total will make a stock out in the months between the first and the last month in this planning period. So, if we now are interested in determining a production plan that doesn't change the size of workforce over the planning horizon, so how should we do that? Uh, and of course, as we saw in the previous picture, if we draw a straight line from the origin uh, of 1940, then the slope of the line is the number of units to produce each month. But this would make a kind of uh, this, this would make a stock out in the month in between. So the solution here, if we should have a constant workforce and not have a stock out, is actually to produce as much as we can meet the. Uh, peak month or the critical month here, but then we can see if we are producing at the same level, we will have too much inventory at, at the end here. But at least if this is the major point, not uh, of, uh, of keeping a constant workforce and not having a stock out, you should plan according to a production rate which meets the critical month, which is March in this particular example. Uh, if we are dividing 1940 by 8, it should be 242.5 per month. But as, as we have seen, this will not uh, be a, uh, a plan which, which will uh, satisfy the, the demand because we will have a stock out in, uh, in the months in between the first and, and the last one. So, and this is... Uh, uh, shown, uh, this uh, figure shown, that we start on, on the 200, which we actually have on, on stock, and then end up on 1940, but we will have a large deviation between the actual cumulated demand for the months in between and what we actually have been producing if we are using uh, the fixed production at the rate of a total of 1940. So, Well, this could be a good plan in some markets if you are able to delay delivery, if the uh, customers can uh, uh, come and order this product and say, uh, it's okay that I get it delivered uh, next month or, or something. Then this could be a, uh, a good uh, strategy for keeping a constant workforce, but then you would have to have some expenses of a delayed uh, delivery. In other markets, uh, delayed delivery is not possible and uh, the customers will go to another shop and, and buy the product if, if you don't have it on hand when they, when they want it. So, the solution here, if still we should have the constant workforce and the constant production, will be to create what we call the constant workforce plan, which is actually also one of the strategies in your assignment on, on problem number two just make a parallel displacement of the line, which <coughs> makes it uh, meet the critical month, which is March in, in this case. So find the straight line that goes through the origin and lies completely above the cumulative net demand curve. And this will be decided by, by the critical month. This will be the constant workforce plan, but as you will see, 
this is the production and here you will have a much higher production for these eight months than actually is needed. So here some things has to be done. Uh, either you will get a very large stock or you need to do some adjustments uh, here. Uh, one possible adjustment is of course not producing. Uh, to say that okay you have this number of workers and they need to be employed but you can find something else to do or, and you, or you can just uh, well not uh, use the workers in, in the production for, for this uh, uh, for this product. <coughs> so, in this case, using this constant workforce plan, we should try to find what is the, the, the critical month, which is here obvious that this is March, and then uh, in this uh, simplest uh, constant workforce strategy, then we should use that production to find out what is the production this constant workforce plan will make for every month. And then we look at this month, the critical month, March, divide by the number of periods, number of months up to that time, which is three. And here is quite easy to see that we need to produce 320 items each month to meet that demand. Means a production here of 320, total 640, and then 960 exactly here. But then you will continue by producing too much. Uh, like this. And then we can look at the inventory in this case because we remember that the inventory cost is one very relevant cost in this case, the cost of storing inventory. Um, here we have the difference between the production and the cumulative demand, which means that we have to store 120 items from one month to the next month. So here we have a straight, uh, well, the, the, the inventory cost is storing from one period to another. Of course, uh, this is some kind of uh, uh, average values because in, in real life it's not that costly to store from the 31st of January to the 1st of February, but this can be seen as some average cost of storing from one period to the next one. So here, a total of uh, yeah, 320 minus 220, which is 100. You will have 100 items on inventory from period one to period two. 640 minus 500 is 140 then 960, exactly what you need in March. Then 1280 minus 1150 is 130. Here we have 140, 1920 minus 1605 is 315. 2240 minus 1715 is 525. And 2560 minus 1940 will be 620. So here in total we will have 1970 items stored from one period to the next period. And then you have to, of course to multiply by the cost of storing one item of inventory for one period to get the total cost of this strategy. But here, we have a constant workforce. You might have to hire some, uh, some people at the start of the planning horizon, but the workforce will be exactly the same for the full planning period here. So 
yeah, this is the same table. And it also, uh, this is not realistic for some reason. It might not be possible to achieve the production level of 320 units per month or per period with an integral number of workers, which we, is when we assume that all workers will be uh, employed by full time. Uh, and then since all the months do not have the same number of work days, a constant production might not tr translate to the same number of workers each month because well, February has only 28 days, January th 35, uh, 31, and there could be, well, Easter holidays, there could be other types of holidays. So the number of working days are not the same for each month, and then we need to take that uh, also into consideration to make a more uh, realistic plan. <coughs> so now we for, uh, before we adjust this plan to, uh, to, to take that into consideration, we should also try to find out how many units is produced for each uh, by one person in one day. Uh, and this, uh, well, this is what we call the K factor, which is found by using historical data. So the K factor. production of one person in one day. And if we know by looking at historical data that uh, the, uh, we have a certain number of uh, workdays, we have a certain number of workers and we have a certain production, where D is the, uh, is the number of, uh, of uh, workdays in a period, the W is the number of workers, number of, and the u will be the number of units. We can find the k factor as the number of units divided by the number of workers and the number of days. If you know that you have produced 520 units in this example in 40 days and that you had on average 38 workers employed for these 40 days you will find the K factor as 520 divided by 40 multiplied by 38. This number gives us a value of 0 0.3421. And this is now the K factor in this particular example. Find the K factor, production of one for one person in one day by Looking at historical data, find the number of units produced, divide by the number of workers employed in that period, or the average if it's uh, changing, and the number of days or working days in, in that period. <coughs> yeah. This is the same calculations that suppose that they are told that over a period of 40 days, we had 38 workers who produced 520 units. We will find the K factor of 0 0.3421, which is the average number of units produced by one worker in one day. <coughs> and if we uh, now try to try to uh, well also consider this production in, uh, uh, in, in this example here uh, and uh, consider the number of days, we should 
just erase these two columns. And include a column which uh, represent the number of days. which we now can say is 22 working days in January. It is 16 in February. Then 23, 20, 21, 22, 21, and 22. And we should now make a new column about the cumulative number of days. which means that you have 22 days in January. January and February together will have 38 days. January, February and March, 61. And then including April, 81. Including May, 102. Including June, 124. And then 145 and 167, including August. So in total you will have 167 days in the period from January to August. And now let's divide the cumulative demand, this column, to the cumulative number of days, this column. Like this. Then we will find that 220 divided by 22 should be 10. Um, and 500 divided by 38 will be 13.16. We have uh, 960 divided by 61 is 15.74. And then 1150 divided by 81, 14.20. And we can continue, 1431, is that? Uh, 1294, 1183, and 1162. And here we have different numbers, and the highest number in this column is this one which represent the critical month. So, even now we have included one more aspect, the number of working days, which is different. We have found that the critical month is March. We need, with, by using a constant workforce plan, we need to plan according to the demand in March, because this will now be the, uh, uh, the critical month, which we need to meet production to, uh, to be sure that uh, we do not get a stock out in, in this period. And to find the number of workers needed, we can say that that W should be equal to um, that critical month, uh, the critical or the cumulative demand divided by uh, days, 1524. Uh, 1574 divided by the k factor, which in this example is 0 0.3421, which tells us that we should have 46 workers needed uh, employed in this period. So we should, at the start of the period, we should employ 46 workers and they should be able to produce uh, in a constant rate to be able to, to meet the demand in March. But then we have also seen in, in the graph that you will have some kind of overproduction for the remaining part of, the, uh, of this uh, time. So we'll yeah, finish this example, maybe a few more minutes, not too much, uh, by using This number, 46, you have the number of workers multiplied by the number of days multiplied by the K factor.
you will find that 46 workers will produce 346 in January 252 362 315 330 346 330 and 346 and do the same as we did with the demand and the days find the cumulative value the cumulative cumulative p 346 and add 252 means that you are producing 598 in January and February adding this number makes a total of 960 which means that in March you have produced exactly enough to meet the cumulative uh, demand and 1275 16 all 5 1951, 2281, and 2627 makes an inventory, which is the difference of production and demand. The, this column minus this column, 126 here, 346 minus. 220 and then 98 and then 0 1 2 5 1 4 5 3 4 6 5 6 6 and 6 87 which means a total of 2093 items which is stored from one month to the next month which is this table here. So this is the, yeah, the, uh, this is the, what we call the constant workforce strategy. And uh, uh, as mentioned, uh, next week we will have this uh, guest lecture. In two weeks we will look at another strategy called the chase strategy or zero inventory strategy. It's when we don't have a constant workforce, but we rather focus on the inventory and try to keep this column as small as possible. And these two uh, strategies are, uh, as mentioned, a part of your uh, assignment number two. Okay, that's enough for today. Next week, a guest lecture, and we continue on this topic in two weeks. <laughs>